And just because you started with Jesus doesn't mean you're going to finish with Jesus. You have to make some effort at it. You've got to do a few things. And like we've talked before, is it really that hard to get out of bed and have fellowship on Sunday? Is it? For some people it is. It's very hard. Uh, is it that hard to pick up the Word of God and read it yourself? Is it that hard to find a quiet place and kneel and talk to the God who did everything possible to save you? Is it that hard? Is it that hard to actually speak up when you actually have a golden opportunity to witness for Jesus? And you know the door is wide open and the person is ready to listen and you've got an audience and yet are you going to open your mouth? You know? So, you know what? There's a few things God asks us to do. And the Bible says if we really love Jesus, we will walk in obedience to his commands. And his commands are not burdensome. That's what 1 John says. It's not impossible what he asks us to do. It's not. It's our own self-will. We want things the way we want them, not the way he wants them. And until you get that conquered in your life, you're going to have a hard time walking with Jesus. It's just that simple. I speak from experience. I'm a willful person just like anybody else. And I've resisted him in certain areas of my life. And guess what? It never goes good mm -hmm. when I resist him. It never goes good. But he's merciful, you know? He doesn't expose us to the whole world very often. You have to be a really rebellious person for him to do that. But, uh, all right, Hebrews chapter 10. Okay, all right. So we've been, chapter 9 was all about the tabernacle and the priesthood and the blood. And remember, we talked last week about how it is, you can't get around it. It's a bloody religion. The Old Testament was all about blood. And the New Testament is all about the blood of Jesus. So if you're squeamish, sorry, it is all about the blood of Jesus now. And the, and the reason you have to get a grasp on that is because only stuff like that can communicate to us how serious our offending God really is. You know, a lot of people just don't think they're that bad. They really don't think God is offended in the way we live our life. Oh, God's bigger than that. He doesn't. He does. All that thunder and lightning at the book of Sin at the Mount Sinai, that's still the real God. And if you don't have Jesus, meet God from Sinai, because that's the God you're going to meet when you die. You can meet the God of Jesus Christ, or you can meet the God of Sinai. But you need to make everybody needs to make up their mind because God without the blood covering of Jesus is still thunder and lightning and holiness. He is. But he suspends judgment if we come to Jesus. And these are not easy teachings. And I'm not going to like build a huge congregation and promise everybody they're going to get rich if they contribute to this ministry. I'm not going to do stuff like that. Oh, we want? I'm just going to tell you the straight gospel <laughs> of what it says. And it says that God's holy. We've offended him. And come get rescued with Jesus Christ. Because otherwise you're going to face the God of Sinai. And I, for one, don't want to face him when he's ticked off. I don't want to. I never wanted to be around my dad when he was ticked off. And I certainly do not want to be around the creator of the universe when he's ticked off. And he only asks one thing. Bow your knee. Admit your sinner. Put your trust in my son. That's all you got to do. It's that simple. But you know what? It's not simple, is it? Because not everybody does it. All right, verse, chapter 10 and verse 1. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. So once again, in the book of Hebrews, it leaves no doubt that the Old Testament version of the law of God was never God's final it was never the perfect presentation of his law. It was a temporary 
wayside on the interstate of, of heading to the New Jerusalem, of heading to heaven. It was a temporary stop on the way. That's what the Old Testament law was. It was shadows and images and types trying to get us to see what was his final intention. That's what the Old Testament was about. And it was for one specific group of people, the people of Israel. Because remember what we've said over and over again. The people of Israel, the 12 tribes, what eventually just narrowed down to the Jewish people, were supposed to be a city set on a hill, a light shining to all the world, so that everyone would come to Israel and Jerusalem, go into the temple, and pray to the one God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That was the intention of all that Old Testament stuff. But because Israel became nationalistic and, and became hostile to the purpose of God in making Gentiles equal with God, that was one thing they could not stand. The idea that a Gentile would be on equal footing with the Jewish person. That they rejected that plan of God. Unfortunately. Most of them. Because we know Sandra here was brought up Jewish and she believed in Jesus. Mm -hmm. So not all Jewish people have rejected Jesus. Some followed. And everybody that wrote a book in the New Testament was Jewish, except maybe Luke. We don't know about Luke for sure, but everybody else was Jewish. So it's a Jewish book, people. The Bible's a Jewish book. Can't get around it. It is. All right. Chapter, verse 2. If it could, the law, would they not have stopped being offered the sacrifices? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Now we know in the Old Testament temporarily God withheld his judgment on men's sin and women's sin because of the sacrifices. He himself said, if you do this, I will punish you. I will forgive you. But that wasn't his final plan. That was a temporary plan on the way to the final plan. Verse 5, Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, and he's quoting from the Old Testament here, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared. With burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, O God. So in other words, there was a prophecy in, a, in Psalm 40 that said there would be someone who would come who would also be called God whose body who would have a body prepared for him and instead of the sacrifices of the Old Testament it would be the body of this person that would come that would finally deal with sin it would be that person not bulls and blood of bulls and goats and all these little animals that were allowed in the Old Testament it was always God's plan that it would be the body of a divine son that would bear the sin of the world. First he said, verse 8, Sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, although the law required them to be made. See, they had to do it because God said it's the only way I'm going to accept you, but that wasn't his final plan. Then he said, here I am, I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second. And by that will, we have been made whole through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So you had the law and you had the oath. The law was given by God temporarily. If you do these things, I will forgive you. But his final plan was the oath. Jesus said, I'll do it. I promise, Father, I'm coming. You prepare my body for me. I am going to leave heaven and go down there. I'm going down. Just prepare the body for me. And that's what he did. The, the eternal word of God left heaven. In, in Philippians, it said he did not consider equality with God something he had to grasp onto to maintain. He gave up certain aspects of his glory. And he became a baby in the form of a baby. And that's what the incarnation, that is an essential teaching of the Christian faith. That God left heaven and somehow 
got compacted into the flesh and blood and bones of a human body. A mystery we'll never understand. Nobody, don't try to. It's not going to happen. It's one of the great mysteries we'll never totally understand. But God said, here I am, Father. God the Father, God the Son had this conversation. One said, I will go. The other said, I will send you. I will prepare the body. And that's what happened. So, at a certain point, Gabriel appears to Mary and announced it's time. The body, it's time for the body to be prepared for the Son of God. And that's what happened. That's what Christmas is all about. It's like the Son of God promising, I'm going to leave heaven. And I'm going to go down there and do what has to be done. He did that almost as good as Charlie Brown. Is that right? <laughs> Charlie Brown? Um, but it's, it's not him. Who Charles does? Schultz? You got the wrong Charlie Brown? But, but who does it in the... the his friend, Charlie Brown's oh, friend. Linus. Linus, yeah. He you did. Oh. Well, maybe I've absorbed that over the years. <laughs> maybe I've absorbed Linus. <laughs> I don't have a blanket I hold on to all the time. Ashley's got the blanket. But yeah, I mean, yes, go ahead. Um, I'm, while you were reading this, I'm, and I know you've, you've done this several times about the old law and it, I'm, I'm kind of like putting my... Sh my, myself into their shoes at this transitional stage, you could see where they would be so confused. Oh, yeah. Even though in, in that transitional stage. Yeah, there were hints of it, George, but it wasn't black and white clear to everybody. I mean, I, I can almost, I almost feel sympathy for them. Yeah. I mean, how confusing to, yeah. to, to change everything. Right. <laughs> but I mean, the fact that Jesus was God was the difficult teaching. But the fact that he was the Messiah was something that should have reason to God. I mean, when a man goes around, raises the dead, drives out demons, heals blind people, uh, you might want to get the idea that there's something special about this person. So whether or not he was God, he was obviously being used by God in a way no other person had ever been used. So, so guess what? We better listen to this guy. Even if he says stuff I don't get, and I, I just can't grab him, get my brain wrapped around it, I can't deny what I see. This man never sins, and he performs miracles all over the place. Every time he talks, I want to sit there for hours and listen to him. I mean, you wouldn't, you should have been able to get that much, George. The apostles got that much, right? They didn't understand that the Messiah had to die. They hadn't figured that out. And they certainly hadn't figured out that this man was actually God. Just very rarely, here and there, they got it. Like when Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. He didn't say he was the Son of God, but I don't know if he fully understood that he was actually God. This was something I think they only were revealed after the resurrection of the dead. You know? Now, we do know that after the resurrection, Thomas fell on his face and said, my Lord is my God. And if he really understood what he was really saying, I don't know. But we know it took some years for the, the apostles, through the help of the Holy Spirit, to write down their Gospels. And only then did, did they start to deal with this. Who was this guy, really? Who was this man? We, we lived with him, but we didn't really know him. We're only beginning to know him now. John probably came close in his Gospel. He's the Gospel that most clearly gets flat out and says, this man was God. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. You know, he, he just came right out and said, you know, and Paul, Paul had obviously took some time to try and deal with this too, to finally come to the point where he could say, God appeared in a body, was vindicated in the Spirit, was seen by angels, was taken up into glory, which he says in 2 Timothy. It took him a while to get to that point. You know? He understood when, on the road to Damascus that this guy is supernatural. He's the Messiah, but he's God. I think that took a little while. The Bible says he spent three years in the desert, wandering around, probably just studying the scripture, praying, fasting, asking God, showing what it was all about. And the next thing we hear about him is he's in preaching that Jesus is the Messiah, whereas three years before he had been killing people. That said that. So I mean, you know, it took a little time. 